Excellencies, students, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, as the Dean of Georgetown University in Qatar, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to our campus today and to today, today's uh, discussion on Pakistan's economic corridor and beyond with Pakistan's Minister of Interior, uh, Minister Ahsan Iqbal Shadri. Minister Shadri is the Federal Minister of Interior and Minister of Planning, Development and Reform for Pakistan. He has been a member of Pakistan's National Assembly since 1993 and has been elected to parliament on four separate terms. He is the Deputy Secretary General of the Pakistan Muslim League, Nawaz, and also a member of Central Executive Committee of the party. He served as Federal Education Minister in the coalition gov government formed after to the 2008 elections and has previously served as chairman of, of the Better Pakistan Foundation and as a professor of management at Muhammad Ali Jinnah University. He was the chief coordinator and author of Pakistan's Vision 2010, and his initiative led to the formulation of the country's first national IT policy. In 2016, he was appointed the United Nations Development Program's champion minister, uh, from the Asia-Pacific region in recognition of his efforts to promote the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Minister Shaudhry has also a connection to Georgetown and we're proud to claim him as one of our own, having participated in the Georgetown Leadership Seminar, an executive education program conducted and hosted by the Institute of, uh, for the Study of Diplomacy at the uh, Edmund Welch School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. He holds an MBA in Strategic Management and Marketing from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, we look forward to the Minister's uh, uh, brief uh, comments and, and presentation today. So please join me in welcoming Minister uh, Shaudi. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you, uh, Dean Ahmed. Uh, I'm really honored. Uh, I'm actually coming straight after two interviews with uh, Al Jazeera Arabic service and English service. So you can well imagine uh, that takes quite uh, an energy to do two back-to-back -back interviews. Uh, but I think uh, uh, Dean has given me some energy because uh, there was a guy like myself who was not a good speaker. And uh, every time you know, he received an invitation to speak, he would readily yet accept it. And send, until the time uh, his uh, uh, speaking engagement was over, his own life and the life of people around him became very miserable because uh, he became very jittery with the fear of uh, facing the audience until that moment was over, that jitterness would, you know, also fall upon people around him. So one day his uh, assistant asked him, Sir, I know that you are not a speaker, a good speaker, and it is not a pleasant experience for you either, because uh, every time you accept a speaking engagement, you s subject yourself to great pain and also make the life of people around you quite miserable. So I just wonder, what is it that keeps you going and accepting all these invitations? So he said, John, it is the pleasure of listening to the introductions. <laughs> so again, you know, <laughs> I'm very honored uh, uh, with a very generous uh, introduction, uh, but uh, it is indeed a great uh, privilege for me to uh, meet students and faculty at Georgetown University in Qatar. And as the Dean mentioned that I had also a great opportunity to attend one of the executive education programs at School of Foreign Service in DC of Georgetown University, and I have very good memories uh, of that uh, program. Uh, as you all know that today we are living in very interesting times. Uh, in a way, as uh, it has been described by many, that our times uh, are best captured by a Chinese quotation uh, which says that uh, when fish is out of water, it flips and flops madly in search of peace. Every flip 
It takes, it expects that it might get peace, but that peace does not come. Uh, it has more pain and then it flops, again searching for peace. And that peace does not come and it keeps flipping and flopping until it either loses life or someone throws it back into water for it to find peace. So in many ways, we are finding that our world today is also flipping and flopping uh, because it is experiencing new challenges which do not, uh, 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 which are not compatible with the structures that evolved over previous centuries uh, in a world which was far more predictable, far more normal, and was based on an industrial revolution. Uh, every time human society undergoes a paradigm shift in terms of its productive capacity, there is a major shakeup in the world landscape, economic, uh, political, uh, just as uh, when we moved from agriculture economy into an industrial economy, there was a major redistribution of power as well as uh, economic structures uh, and social structures all over the world. Uh, many countries that were behind became the new leaders and many countries which were dominant in pre-industrial world became, uh, you know, uh, no, almost uh, they went behind and became followers. So now we are again in that punctuated equilibrium state where the environment is changing, new uh, realities are emerging, social, political, economic, uh, tectonic plates of uh, human uh, civilization are undergoing fundamental changes. And with this movement of the plate tectonics, we find jolts in different parts of the world. So that way, these are very uh, challenging and interesting times and I think the role of leadership is to make as smooth a transition as possible by following a more collaborative path uh, because the world is now far more connected than it ever was. Uh, what happens today in Pacific, Island, Pacific Ocean Island very soon catches up with anyone everywhere. Uh, you cannot uh, close the societies or countries with any uh, walls around uh, that country. Uh, you know, was someone hitting one button in remote island on social media can cause some big event uh, somewhere else in the world. So this connectivity and network nature of the new world requires that we also form collaborative platforms uh, for in pursuit of shared destiny of mankind. Uh, in this, uh, in this uh, networked and uh, more connected world, any effort to disconnect or any effort for confrontation can have very serious implications for everyone. And conflicts, in conflicts, there are no winners. Uh, everyone is a loser. And Pakistan is one country that has experienced it uh, for too much time. Since 1979, we have seen how conflicts destabilize regions, how conflicts can destabilize the fiber of society, and how conflicts can undermine political and economic stability of countries. Uh, in 1979, when Soviets invaded Afghanistan, uh, a new conflict started in our region that was in shape of the war against so evil, so-called evil empire uh, at the behest of the Western world and which was led by United States. And I always say that our security agencies neither had the telephone number nor telex uh, contact, that was the age of telex contacts of Osama bin Laden. Uh, nobody in our country knew who he was. Uh, but he was uh, introduced to our security agencies by Western security agencies. Along with him came 
a baggage of number of jihadis from Middle East, from Burma, and from everywhere. And then Pakistan became uh, the base station, the frontline state to fight the evil empire. Uh, universities in the United States prepared special curricula for the schools of Afghan refugee children uh, to make them more militant and make them more radicalized so that they could fight uh, the Soviets. Uh, in the process, when this war was being fought, a militancy and terrorism started developing roots also in our country. Many madrasas which existed in our country for centuries and were very peaceful, they were radicalized so that their graduates could produce the warriors who will fight the Soviets in Afghanistan. But as soon as Soviets were defeated and they pulled out of Afghanistan, everybody washed their hands and left that place. And if you leave poorest of the poor societies with dumps of ammunition and missiles and radicalized ideology, that society will never produce Ford motor vans or IBM computers. It will only produce or breed militancy and terrorism. And that is what happened in that part of the world. Pakistan had to support 3.5 million refugees for over three decades now. Today, you see the images of few dozen refugees going from Syria to Europe or to North America. There is a hue and cry in the whole media that how these refugees are coming to our society. And I think at best there are a few thousand maybe. Uh, but for us, it was millions. And Pakistan was neither Europe nor it was your, uh, United States. It was a third world country with very weak economy and we had to bear this burden for many decades. So the trophy of Soviet defeat went to United States with its intellectuals declaring end of the history, that now we have won the final war, the human history has come to its logical end. In Europe, Berlin Wall came down and the trophy went to Germany through unification of Germany. But in Pakistan, till this date, we are paying the price of those trophies. We are still paying the price for the defeat of communism and Soviet Union for unification of Germany. In shape of drugs, in shape of Klashnikovs, and in shape of millions of refugees who still are living in Pakistan. So Pakistan has a long experience of conflict. And our experience is conflict has no winners. Everyone is a loser in conflict. So it is very important that we understand that if we want to save this world, if we want to create a safer world, we must have a shared sense of future and a shared sense of destiny. The destiny is no longer dissected. In a networked and a connected world, there is only a shared destiny for everyone. And that requires people to work together. And in this background, I think, uh, the One Belt, One Road initiative uh, offered by Chinese leadership is very uh, progressive and very powerful idea. Because what it seeks is that today world is in crisis because world economy is showing signs of fatigue because of several reasons. The world economy has slowed down, growth is not happening in Europe and United States, the real engines of world economy. So there are now two kinds of responses that are emerging. In most of the developed world, the response is that let us develop or build walls to protect ourselves against this new challenge that is emerging. 
But unlike this response, China is responding in its own wisdom. As the Chinese proverb says, that when the winds of change are blowing, you can either construct walls to protect yourself or you can construct windmills to be beneficiary of those winds. The response of China is that if we really are connected and if we have a shared destiny, then we must work together to see that how we can recreate growth in world economy. Economy slows down or growth comes down when there is no demand. When the demand slows, the growth comes down. So if we want growth in world economy, we need to generate demand. Now demand is not happening from the existing markets. So that means that you must seek to create new markets so that there is new demand. If we have to create new markets, then we have to create new connectivity. Through new connectivity, we can create new markets and that will create more demand and that will have an opportunity for everyone to aspire for more growth. So this is the larger vision which China offers through One Belt, One Road. On Pakistan side, when we came in government in 2013, we inherited a big mess. The country was in deep crisis. Newsweek had put Pakistan on its title page that the most dangerous country in the world is not Iraq, it is Pakistan. Our energy was facing acute uh, crisis with 18 to 20 hours of power shortages very common all over the country. The workers were uh, jobless, they were out on the streets and the, there were news that there might be civil war in Pakistan due to energy or power, power crisis. Similarly, terrorism had taken big toll and not a day would pass when there was not a terrorist incident in any part of the country. As a matter of fact, if on any day the human toll was five, six or seven or a single digit figure, people would say that today we have a peaceful day because the toll is in single uh, digit. That was the Pakistan of 2013. And what we also found was that many of these problems had happened because country had uh, uh, treaded for last 14 years without any sense of direction. We did not have any strategic plan or a roadmap or a vision where we wanted to go. After 9-11, General Musharraf regime became beneficiary of very liberal inflows. In five years, almost $90 billion inflow came into Pakistan. But that all was consumed to create an artificial prosperity from uh, motor car to motorcycle to grocery. Everything was available on leasing. So there was an artificial consumer economy or a service economy that was created. And as a result, when this bubble busted, we were in deep crisis. So we found economy to be stuck in last years of our, uh, before coming uh, into government, to be stagnant in three to three and a half percent range. And some economists had coined the term of Urdu growth rate for Pakistan slow growth, just as in 90s, economists had coined Hindu growth rate term for India's slow growth rate. Uh, that was uh, economy. Uh, and energy, as I said, was bad. Terrorism was bad. And therefore, we came in government on three slogans, E, 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 energy, economy, and elimination of extremism. So in 2014, we initiated Vision 2025 exercise uh, to work with opinion leaders and chalk out a roadmap for Pakistan that where should Pakistan be headed. And one very important outcome of that exercise was uh, that Pakistan has a unique advantage in shape of its location. 
and we have been leveraging that advantage in our previous history in the realm or in the orbit of geopolitics. We must change the journey from orbit of geopolitics to geoeconomics as we find that Asia is now emerging as the next uh, growth uh, center in world economy with uh, Asia envisaged to account for about 52% of the global GDP by 2050. There are three powerful engines of growth in areas adjoining Pakistan, South Asia, China, and Central Asia. And Pakistan happens to be located at the intersection of these three engines of growth. If we can create north-south and east-west connectivity corridors, Pakistan can integrate these three engines of growth into one large economic or regional block with three billion population. That is the future where Pakistan should aspire to make itself a hub of trade, commerce, and business for this big economic region or economic block that can be developed with improved regional connectivity. So this was part of our vision 2025. And China had its One Belt, One Road initiative where it was also seeking to construct regional connectivity corridors to create a future of shared uh, destiny. Uh, in 2013, uh, an MOU was signed uh, between uh, two countries, and I had the honor of signing this document from Pakistani side in presence of the two prime ministers. So 5th of July 2013, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor was a piece of paper uh, which we signed as, an as a document of intent that two countries must chalk out plans and work uh, uh, together to create this vision, to translate this vision of China-Pakistan Economic Corridor into reality. Uh, I must say that, you know, because there was a strong ownership and strong political will on both sides, within one year, uh, we were able to translate this MOU into an understanding of a portfolio of about $46 billion, of which $35 billion were allocated for energy sector investment and $11 billion for infrastructure investments in Pakistan from China. This was supposed to be launched in September 2014 with President Xi's visit to Pakistan but unfortunately, at that time, due to certain domestic political events in our country, uh, the visit of President of China got postponed. And subsequently, he came in April 2015, and China-Pakistan Economic Corridor was officially launched, and MOUs were signed. And after two years of that launch, I'm very happy to say that out of that $46 billion commitments, we have been able to energize so far $27 billion of investment in different projects, which are either now on ground or for which financing agreements have been signed and are about to hit the ground very shortly. Now, this is again a unique opportunity and unique success in our history and also in the modern history uh, in uh, the context of regional cooperation initiatives. So CPAC has become the biggest flagship project of One Belt, One Road. And outside One Belt, One Road, I think, is even the biggest regional connectivity uh, project that is happening anywhere with such big uh, portfolio of projects. Under CPAC, we have identified four areas on which CPAC is focusing. The first area is development of Gawadar port as a future smart port of the region, which will become 
a center of maritime trade and transshipment in this region. Gwadar has a unique opportunity. It is a deep sea port. It has shortest distance to China, and it also is closest to landlocked Central Asian republics, and is also located very strategically at the mouth of Strait of Hormuz or the Persian Gulf, from where, due to the uh, very uh, 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 narrow uh, uh, width of Persian Gulf, uh, big ships take a lot of time to turn around and the maritime trade fields that if there is a transshipment port outside of uh, Strait of Hormuz, uh, big ships can offload cargo and small ships can take cargo inside the Gulf. That will bring more efficiency and reduce costs of logistics. So uh, besides this transshipment, uh, Gavadar port also is envisaged to provide an outlet to the new economic zones that are likely to emerge in the West China, uh, particularly the Kashgar economic zone, uh, which will be ready in next five to 10 years. Similarly, uh, Mongolia sees Gwadar as the port which it can uh, use, and all Central Asian republics feel very excited uh, for Gwadar to be a port uh, that can serve them. So the first uh, uh, factor or the first uh, uh, point of CPAC uh, development model is developing Gwadar as a modern port city that will help uh, integrate the region. Uh, Gwadar will not compete with Bandar Abbas or Dubai port or any other port. The vision we perceive for Gwadar is that it will complement the existing infrastructure in this region. We believe that there are so much, so much we can gain by collaboration that the pie can expand. And if the pie can expand, we will all gain from that collaboration. It is not either Gavadar or the other port. We think that there is a uh, uh, you know gain to be made by making collaboration the platform uh, for uh, all the regional infrastructure to complement uh, each other. Gavadar is not a security port. It is purely an economic and commercial port. The second aspect of CPAC is energy because we were uh, facing acute energy shortage and primarily because for 14 years after 2000 and till 2013, no worthwhile investment was made in energy sector. Uh, in 1999, we were energy surplus. At actually that point, uh, India was negotiating with Pakistan to purchase some surplus electricity that Pakistan had. But beyond 99, the regimes overlooked that our demand was growing, our population was growing, that if we have surplus energy today, if we will not add new energy, one day we will run into deficit. And when we did Vision 2010 in 98, we had projected that beyond 2004, country will run in deficit. So we will need to augment our energy base. But unfortunately, successive regimes after that ignored investment in energy sector. So we were running a big deficit of six to 7,000 megawatts by 2013. So we focused then on energy as a major building block of CPAC in the first phase. Because in a modern economy, energy is like oxygen uh, for human life. If you don't have energy, you cannot build modern economy. So $35 billion out of the $46 billion investment that was earmarked were devoted for energy sector. And these energy projects are all in IPP mode. Government of Pakistan is not borrowing a single dollar for any energy project. They are all coming as private investment. And the other important uh, attribute of this energy investment is in the past, no one had managed investments in energy 
uh, in a portfolio context. First, we were heavily dependent on Heidel Energy. 70% of our power was uh, generated through Heidel. And if you are exposed to one source that heavily, uh, one disturbance or one uh, uh, you know, disruption in that source can actually disrupt the entire power supply in the country. Because if you have two uh, years in succession which are dry, which is a dry spell, and they're not uh, rains taking place to fill your dams, you can have serious uh, problem if you are overly exposed to just idle. But then in 1994, uh, when the PPP government launched new energy policy, they went too far on oil-based power generation. So from 70% hydel, our exposure became 70% to oil-based power generation. The result was that when the oil prices went up to $100 or $80 or $90, it became unaffordable for us to run all those power plants. So while we were facing power shortages, we were unable to run all those power plants because they required very heavy uh, foreign exchange for import of oil. So we were unable to benefit from that uh, energy generation capacity uh, that was uh, oil-based. So we also sought through this investment to diversify power generation and to optimize our own indigenous resources, which are hydro, renewables, and coal. Pakistan has about uh, 400 years worth of coal deposit in Thar area, in Thar desert in Sindh, uh, where if we generate 5,000 megawatts of energy, that is good for next 400 years. But in 70 years, nobody ever thought or tried to seriously exploit this indigenous resource, which Pakistan was blessed in shape of black gold, I would say. So one of the principal uh, areas where we focused in energy was to tap into this uh, local coal resource in Thar area in Sindh province so that we can have our own cheap energy for future and also we can diversify our power generation. And mind you, Pakistan already produces less than 1% of its power from coal, unlike India, United States and many other countries which use 40 to 60% uh, of their coal-based power as, uh, for, you know, as part of their in, uh, total generation, 40 to 60% is based on coal. So we already had zero footprint in terms of our coal resources. So we tried to uh, then focus on this, and today I'm happy to say that there are two coal mining projects on which work is processing, uh, proceeding very fast. Uh, they, are, they have dug almost more than half of the mine, and we are expecting that by 2019, uh, uh, power generation will start from Thar-based coal projects. Similarly, we have uh, two major hydro projects, uh, Soki Kanari and Karot, uh, which will generate about 1,700 uh, megawatts uh, of energy through hydro. And then we have uh, wind and solar-based energy, 1,000 in solar and about 4, 400 plus in wind energy. Uh, that will give uh, us uh, uh, some uh, know-how and also technology in the future uh, area of uh, power generation that is renewables, in which we had no significant uh, footprint uh, in Pakistan. So energy is the priority area, and as I sh shared with you, that through this very uh, strategic and critical investment, we are diversifying the sources of power generation and ensuring that Pakistan is able to overcome energy shortage and also have some surplus for future. Let me also say that we have been very mindful that we should not be polluting our area. So in coal energy, we have opted for supercritical technology, which is considered globally very safe technology for dealing with coal-based power generation. The third uh, element of CPAC relates to infrastructure, and that includes uh, construction of roads, improving road connectivity with China through different areas of Pakistan. 
there is one route which goes in the west of Pakistan connecting Balochistan, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa with uh, Karakoram Highway. Uh, there is one alignment that will pass through the eastern uh, side of uh, the country uh, which uh, has bulk of the population uh, in Sin, in Punjab and then connect to Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. And in future we will also have a central alignment uh, which will run mid in the middle of the western and the uh, eastern uh, routes. Uh, the idea again is that we do not envisage a container-based economy uh, through China-Pakistan Economic Corridor where uh, through Gawadar there should be container shipments going to China and container shipments coming to Gawadar from China. What we envisage that Pakistan should become a processing hub where there can be supply, there should be supplies going to different markets, to different industrial centers where value addition takes place. From there we are able to export items to outside world and similarly also import raw material, process it in Pakistan and export to China. So therefore it is important to have links uh, from Gawadar port to different uh, parts of the country. Uh, this will not only create a platform for CPAC, but also it will connect the country from within. And our government has a special focus on connectivity because our experience tells us that connectivity is the first step of development and is the first step of inclusive development because unless you will connect remote areas with the developed markets or the developed areas, they will always remain isolated and they will always be marginalized. So it is only through connectivity that you can ensure people's participation in development process. You can take benefits to them. You can take education to them. You can take healthcare to them. You can take uh, better uh, business uh, opportunities. So uh, the, besides CPAC, we are also heavily investing from our own public sector, sector development plan on construction of networks of roads all over the country, which in next two to three years will provide us a great amount of connectivity within Pakistan. Uh, within infrastructure, the other major investment that we are making is in the rail uh, transport area. Uh, unfortunately, again, here in last 20 years, uh, railway transportation was neglected. As a result, the infrastructure was depleting and our speed of trains had decreased from 100 kilometers to 60 to 80 kilometers on most of the sections thereby reducing the speed of the train, uh, causing more delays, and also making economy less competitive because if you have a late movement, uh, movement of goods which are delayed, that adds to the cost of transportation and production uh, equation. So that makes uh, the country less competitive compared to other economies. So we are uh, in the first phase focusing on modernization of Karachi to Peshawar main line railway track, which carries 80% of the passenger and cargo traffic in Pakistan. And this will be a four-year project, about $8 billion investment. And with this, we hope that the speed will double from 80 kilometers to 160 kilometers uh, per hour. That will mean that the distance from Peshawar to Karachi will be cut by 50%. The fourth very interesting and challenging area is that the purpose of CPAC is not to construct infrastructure in Pakistan. The uh, infrastructure is means. The focus and goal of CPAC is to one, industrialize Pakistan's economy and two, to make Pakistan an attractive hub for the region for business and trade. In this context, we are again trying to uh, align ourselves with a great opportunity that exists for us. Uh, every economy that grows follows a certain path. Initially, it enters uh, low labor cost industry or labor in in intensive industries uh, where they develop their competitive advantage. But as that economy grows and develops, uh, and goes higher on the development ladder, the wages also increase in that country. 
at that point that economy begins to relocate labor intensive and uh, light uh, sectors of industries to other countries where the production cost is less this happened with britain this happened with united states this happened with germany this happened with japan this happened with korea this happened with china they all benefited uh, from this process now china's uh, per capita income which was uh, about 200 dollars in 1980 uh, and by the way our per capita income 1980 was 300 dollars so now china has gone beyond 8000 dollars per capita income so you can imagine from 200 where it developed certain comparative advantage in certain industries it is at 8000 uh, dollars per capita income so their wages have increased considerably in many sectors and that is becoming more and more difficult for them to compete and now they are in the process of relocating those industries to other uh, countries where cost of production is less and it is estimated that there will be about 85 million jobs which will be relocated from china to other countries which have low cost of production and we are already seeing that happen you know many industries have gone to vietnam many industries have gone to laos many industries have gone to cambodia many industries are going to ethiopia so they are going to different african and asian countries where cost of production is less so now under cpac the fourth phase is that with this infrastructure and energy in place beyond 2020 we are uh, hoping to establish about nine industrial zones in pakistan uh, which will be equally created in all the provinces uh, so that every province can benefit and they will be based based on the comparative advantage of that particular province and uh, we are now trying to work with chinese side to attract relevant Chinese industries to relocate their operations in these economic zones so that through this investment we can start give a kickstart to industrialization process in Pakistan that will mean uh, more jobs uh, will be created and with Chinese investment and technology coming in Pakistan that will raise the bar and also the benchmark that will also drive our local businesses to strive for more competitiveness for their products and in their own operations. So this is not to hurt them, but this is to create a good, healthy uh, environment of competition and also collaboration where Pakistani businesses will seek joint ventures with Chinese counterparts to set up these uh, 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 industrial uh, units in the economic zones. So we hope that this will be an important part of this uh, CPAC uh, and it will culminate uh, with uh, giving impetus to industrialization of Pakistan so that we can graduate from low value agriculture economy to higher value uh, industrial economy. So this is uh, most, uh, the, m these are the major, uh, you know, uh, 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 hallmarks or uh, major uh, uh, factors that are included in uh, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. And with this uh, investment, as I said, we are hoping that we will also be able to integrate this with our other initiatives like uh, Central Asia Region Economic Cooperation, CARIC uh, Network, uh, which is uh, funded by World Bank and Asian Development Bank. And we are also investing and uh, focusing on construction of two corridors through Karak. One is uh, in the north of Pakistan through Peshawar to Kabul and Kabul to Tajikistan. Uh, and the other one is south of Pakistan through Koita to Herat, Herat to Turkmenistan. So we hope that in next five to 10 years when the two uh, uh, corridors uh, are completed, Pakistan will be well positioned to serve that region and also be a major hub. As far as the eastern side is concerned, we equally look uh, towards uh, South Asia. And Pakistan has always sought a normalization of relations uh, with India uh, so that uh, our region, which is least regionally integrated uh, region in the world, 
also can benefit from regional cooperation. But unfortunately, Indian government refuses to uh, talk and also sees uh, CPAC as some kind of a conspiracy. Uh, although we do try to uh, convince them that this is not a conspiracy, rather this is a partnership-based uh, initiative for the entire region to work, to come together and try to collaborate so that we can create more opportunities uh, for our future generations. And South Asia, unfortunately, which has world's highest UNs, UNs, you know, uh, uneducated, unhealthy, unemployed, and all the UNs you can think uh, live in South Asia. So we have a big responsibility to create an environment based on peace and mutual respect so that we can all focus not on fighting wars, but, all, but fighting poverty and fighting unemployment. Uh, that is a big risk for our region. Uh, but somehow they have a knee-jerk reaction to CPAC. But uh, I am beginning to see that the serious analysts in India are now beginning to question the position of their government, that why the government of India has a negative view of CPAC and they should uh, reassess their uh, uh, response to CPAC and try to engage with Pakistan uh, so that it can also become part of uh, the opportunities that will arise out of CPAC. But till such time they will make up their mind, we are nevertheless committed to moving forward with other partner countries who are committed to this shared vision of prosperity in our uh, region. And I always tell my Indian friends, uh, you know, the problem is that uh, you do not have a uh, heart as big as your size. Only if you have half the size of your geography of your heart, uh, South Asia would be a very different place. So I hope that, you know, in future we can all work together and create opportunities for everyone. Uh, and Pakistan, I think, is now well poised uh, with uh, the f uh, three dimensions I shared with you, energy, economy, and extremism. In last four years, we have been able to turn the tide. Just you, would have, you must have read in the news also that a few days ago, World Bank reported that Pakistan has achieved the highest growth rate in last 10 years, which is 5.3%. And this year, we are hoping to come close to 6%. So in last four years, every year we have achieved a higher growth rate. So we are now on path of economic growth. We have been able to defeat uh, considerably extremism and improve the security situation. Uh, eight years ago, a terrible incident took place in Pakistan with an attack on Sri Lankan cricket team. Since then, no sporting team would even venture to think of coming to Pakistan. But in 2017, we have seen a number of sporting events uh, with international teams and players coming to Pakistan, which is a sign of Pakistan's security situation becoming normal again. Uh, we have paid a heavy price. Uh, military, police, security agencies, and people of Pakistan have worked together now. Uh, terrorism is down by 90% and uh, Karachi is secure, rest of the country is secure, and uh, shadows of peace are becoming longer. Similarly, we have added 10,000 megawatts of new power, which will be ready by June of 2018 in four years, compared to 16,000 megawatts in 66 years. I repeat, in 66 years, we had 16,000 megawatt capacity but in four years, we would be adding 10,000 megawatts of power, which is again unprecedented in our history and very ambitious uh, from other countries' point of view also that we have been able to accomplish. Uh, so economy is reviving, energy is getting better, extremism is being defeated, uh, CPAC is a promising star. So we certainly are very now excited and we are talking to other countries, including GCC countries, Mid other Middle Eastern countries and African countries who are also wanting to be part of the new emerging global supply chains or the regional supply chains that will emerge uh, with uh, CPAC. So we hope uh, that CPAC will create uh, a platform to bring people together and bring peace and stability to a region that has paid a heavy price for conflict. Thank you very much.